what a beautiful thing to be able to come together as a family of faith. We are ending a year. We're bringing in a new year. It's possible to let go of things in the old year and to embrace all that God wants to do in our lives in the new year. Can I hear an amen to that? And uh, I've been in a bit of a series uh, talking about the mysteries of God over the last couple of weeks. And we've talked about how it is that God has moved with unexpected people in unexpected places and unexpected ways. The mysteries of God and the mystery uh, that we see, that word in the New Testament is musterion, which sounds like such a cool sounding word, musterion. There is a mystery sometimes to how God moves and how life is and how God is moving in the midst of all of these things uh, in our lives. But the beauty of it is that in that word, mysterion, we see that the secret things of God are revealed to us as he seeks to reveal what he's doing in our lives. And the Christmas story is God revealing who he is, how he moves amongst us, how powerful and yet how personal he is to us. I think of some of my favorite stories as a church, Capital Life Church, in regard to Christmas. Over the years, we celebrated our 20th anniversary this year. Let's give God glory for that. 20 years as a church. We came out here right before 9-11, just 11 days before 9-11, my family. And I moved out here. And, and, uh, and then with all the events of 9-11, we started a prayer center. Out of that became a church. And then, uh, almost a decade ago, we moved into this wonderful building that God has given to us in this property so that we can have a headquarters of hope right in the D.C. metro area. And we love our community. We love being able to reach out and bless people at Thanksgiving time, Christmas time, all the way through the year. But one of the stories that I think of when I think of Christmas in Capital Life Church was the year that we were not in this building yet. We were in a place called the Roslyn Performing Arts Center. It was right across the street from the old museum. And, uh, and we were renting. And so we came on Christmas uh, to have service, uh, to have our Sunday morning service, only to find out we had been locked out. And I still remember the feeling because those of us who got there early thought, what are we going to do? We only have a small lobby area here. People are going to be showing up at any moment. And, uh, and, and it was amazing to see people take ownership and say, let's find some chairs somewhere. I'm sure there's a closet somewhere in somebody's office. We were in a big office building. And we started to grab chairs and make uh, a makeshift sanctuary in that lobby and spilling out towards an elevator. And that is one of the most memorable services we ever had. And I think the reason why was we all started to participate. We didn't come just to attend and listen. We came to participate in the story of Christ's birth. We talked about how it was that there was no room in the inn and we started to feel it. We started to feel what it was like to be locked out, shut out, and yet, to know that we're coming together as a family of faith. A second story that comes to mind in the history of our church and when it comes to Christmas was when I was sharing the story of an astronaut by the name of Jim Irwin. It's one of my favorite stories that we've experienced over the two decades of being a church. And I was sharing uh, at one of our Christmas services how it was that Jim Irwin, one of only 12 men to walk on the moon, was being interviewed. And the one giving uh, uh, the interview or conducting the interview asked the astronaut, were you amazed to think that you walked on the moon? Does that amaze you? What was it like? It must have been amazing. And Jim Irwin responded by saying, it doesn't so much amaze me that man walked on the moon. What amazes me most is that God walked on earth. I thought, what a powerful way to state that. So I shared that in one of our services, and at the conclusion of the service, two women walked up, right, right here, and uh, said, hello, we want to introduce ourselves to you. I said, I'd be delighted. 
And the one lady told me her name, and she said, and by the way, the one that's standing right, right next to me is married to one of the 12 men that walked on the moon. Now, what are the odds? I thought it was a joke. I thought she was, you know, this was something where a punchline was coming. And I, so I looked at the lady. I said, is that right? And she said, yes, my husband was Charles Conrad. I said, Pete Conrad? She said, yes. I said, absolutely, he's one of our heroes, our national heroes. And she said, well, the fact that you would share a story about uh, his good friend, Jim Irwin, and what he said about God walking on earth, I think this is meant to be my church. And she was here with us for a while after that until she moved off to New York. What an amazing thing that God can bring us together and do um, incredible things right in the midst of us. And when I think of the Christmas story, when I think of all that God is doing, I think of the book of John. Let's go to John, the first chapter. We'll start with the first 14 verses here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I want you to know, Jesus is called the Word. What is being spoken of here is this mystery, mystery again, mysterion, that Jesus is the Son of God, yes, but Jesus is God himself, the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, it's true. But we also know that Jesus existed before Bethlehem. So all of this, this amazing thing that God is giving us a glimpse into, which are the things of God hidden until he reveals them to us. I read it again. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, children born not of natural descent, not of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh. I want to say it again. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, John's intent, the writer of this gospel, John's intent in his opening paragraph of this gospel isn't to give a, a historical account of the nativity story. He doesn't assemble like the gospel writer Luke does an orderly account. He doesn't, like Matthew, speak of the lineage of Jesus or his rightful claim to messiahship. John does it different than the other gospels. John begins with the thoughts that he shares about creation and wisdom and knowledge and life. John states that out of the heavens and across the millenniums and through human history, we read about the Word and how the one who existed for all time came to dwell amongst us. God known as being everywhere was now known as God being somewhere. You could touch him. You could hold him. You could talk to him. You could know him. God wasn't out there as some religious thought to where you can't reach him. God was walking right here amongst us that we might know what he is like, what God is like. God was findable. He was one of us. And remember the shepherds who heard the angels who came and they said, uh, this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby. You'll be able to find him. 
You'll be able to hold him and touch him. He'll be wrapped in claws and, li- uh, and living, or rather lying in a manger. God was findable. And God had come in person. Now, I want to share a little brief story about coming in person. Listen, there was a man in Wales, true story, uh, that came out a few years ago. This man in Wales sought for 42 years to win the affection of a certain woman. 42 years. Some of you are a little anxious when you hear 42 years. Finally, in 1985, on his 43rd attempt, she said yes. And by then, they were 74 years of age. Every week for more than 40 years, this rather shy man slipped a weekly love letter under his neighbor's door. After writing 2,184 love letters without ever getting a response, this persistent old man finally summoned up enough courage to present himself in person. He knocked on the door of the reluctant lady and asked for her hand in marriage. And to his delight and surprise, she said yes. Now, there's something about coming in person. There's something about coming in person. And God came to walk amongst us. God came to dwell amongst us. The story of Jesus is, and his coming is a story that had eyewitnesses. In 2 Peter 1.16, the Bible says, for we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. The writers of the New Testament went to great lengths to let you know Jesus is a true historical figure. They offer names, they offer dates, they offer places. The names of government leaders like Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, religious, religious leaders like uh, Annas and Caiaphas. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. made this statement. He said, evil may so shape events that Caesar will occupy a palace and Christ the cross, but one day that same Christ will rise up and split history into A.D. and B.C., so that even the life of Caesar must be dated by his name. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. Let's look at this for a moment. What a beautiful scripture this is. It is a foretelling of a child that will be born, but long before he's born. A prophet declares, Isaiah the prophet declares, that one will be born. I don't think there's any, anybody who foresaw the Christ child so well the Messiah so well as Isaiah. Listen to his words long before Jesus is born in Bethlehem. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. In the Old Testament, there are 322 messianic prophecies foretelling things that must be absolutely accurate as to the one who will come and say he is the Messiah. All were fulfilled in Jesus And this one, Isaiah wrote about him some 730 years before the child was actually born in Bethlehem. Now, I want you to celebrate the baby Jesus as we celebrate Christmas, but I also want you to know who he is. Who is this one that came? Again, Isaiah tells us, wonderful counselor. Do you need counsel? Do you need wisdom? Do you need to hear the heart of God in your life right now and have God speak into your life? He is the mighty counselor. He is the mighty God. Do you feel like the odds are against you? You've got the mighty God who has come on the scene and is for you. And if God be for you, who can be against you? No weapon formed against you will prosper, the word says. He is the everlasting father. Well, we're celebrating a little baby in a manger. He is the everlasting father. He is the prince of peace and our world is desperately in need of peace right now and he is our peace and he is your peace at this moment 
So as you celebrate the one who has come named Jesus, I want you to know he's your peace. He's the one that gives peace that the Bible says is beyond all understanding. In other words, we can't even comprehend why we have the peace that we have in the midst of the world we live in, in the midst of all the things that have been happening in our lives. But he brings that peace. He is that peace. Unless we celebrate a baby and leave him in a manger, Isaiah tells us who this baby is to all of us. In the Gospels, Matthew focuses on Jesus as the king. It's his main theme in what he writes about. So this one that came that was placed in a manger is the king of kings. And Mark, in his gospel, speaks of him as being a servant. What a humble thing that God would allow himself to be so small, to be so fragile as to be in his mother Mary's arms, dependent upon the milk of his mother. And yet we see his servant heart. Luke, in his script, in his uh, gospel, Luke is a medical doctor, and Luke speaks of Jesus as the healer. Have you come here today and you need healing? You need healing in your heart? You need healing in your mind? You need healing in your family? You need healing so that you can go forth from here whole and complete, knowing that nothing can hold you down because God is for you? Luke tells us the one that is born is your healer. And then John says, he's your savior. Religion won't save us. Being in a church building won't save us. We need a savior who died on the cross, who was perfect in every way, but died for our sins so that we wouldn't have to, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But we know that amidst, in the midst of our sin, God loved us. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son that whosoever would believe on him would not perish but have everlasting life. And this is the love of God that is extended to you right now. Jesus is the Savior. John wants us to know that. John speaks of him as the good shepherd. John speaks of him as the way, the truth, and the life, as the word become flesh. And we celebrate today, yes, a baby, but we celebrate a liberator, a deliverer, so that we can be delivered from the things that would try to hold us down and torment us. You can be liberated today. You can be completely whole and healed in the now. And I know that God wants to do that. God loves you unconditionally. God knows your name. He formed you in your mother's womb. God knows you full well. I'm speaking scripture, not my thoughts. And God loves you and wants you to be set free from anything, anything that is causing you to have anxiety. The Christmas story answers the great questions of life. Does God exist? Why was I born? Can I know God? What is he like? What is the ultimate purpose for my life? In Matthew 1, we see some words that are pretty powerful. Cat, who uh, helped in leading uh, in worship uh, in this service, she read the scripture, and I want to draw you to the 23rd verse of the scripture, where we see that the angel states to Mary that her baby will be known as Emmanuel, and Emmanuel means God with us. In the Greek, the word is meta, meaning that God is with us in proximity, Now, we've talked about that. God walked earth. He was knowable. He was findable. He was huggable. He was all of these things. But we also see another meaning to this word in the Greek. Not only does it mean God with us in proximity, it means God with us in an interactive way. In other words, he participates in life with us. He's here in the now with you at this very moment. God's arms are wrapped around you. God, again, is for you and not against you. And no enemy can come against you when God's got you. And the healing of God goes beyond anything we could imagine. Carlo Coretto said these words, If Jesus is truly God, everything is clear. If I cannot believe this, everything darkens again. Jesus came so that we could experience God to know God's love, not just about God's love, but to know God's love, not just about his healing, but to be those that are healed. 
Jesus came to confront sin. that We might be free from all that sin would wreak havoc in our lives. And that we could be healed. And that we could join with him in eternal purpose. Do you know there's a calling on your life? When was the last time you thought about the calling that is on your life? And in Romans 15, 4, the Bible says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. So that through the endurance taught in the scriptures, and yes, God is calling us to endure, lift your head high, we can know that we can endure with his strength and health. So that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the, and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. And here is our hope. The word became flesh and dwelt among, amongst us. And here is our hope. We can know the word. We can know what it is to have the word active in our lives. We celebrate a baby in a manger, but I'm telling you, he's no longer a baby in a manger. Our God is large and in charge, powerful and all for you. Rise to your feet, if you will. The secret things that belong to God are now revealed to us. Let's bow our heads before a mighty and powerful and a personal God. And Heavenly Father, as we do, as we bow our heads, God, we thank you for bringing greater clarity to all that you are doing on planet Earth and all you're doing in our own families and in our own hearts and lives. Why it is that Jesus came in person and who he is to us. God, we pray that we might embrace him as Savior now, not as a story from long ago that is known around the globe and that is often spoken of, but something deeper. That we might know Jesus as our Savior and Lord. That we might know him as healer. Now the healer moves amongst us. The healer is here to touch you right now. The healer is here to heal you of abuses of the past. The healer is here to give you a healing in your mind in regard to anxiety, in regard to the things that would try to cause you not to sleep at night. Your healer is present. Are you aware of it? The one who has come to give you hope is here. You say, I've already had such a gut punch. I don't know that I can ever have hope again. I don't know that I'll ever know the joy unspeakable and full of glory. But I want you to know joy unspeakable means that unspeakable sense. In other words, we can't even describe the joy that is supernatural that can be given to us in the midst of all of the chaos, in the midst of all of the questions. And so Heavenly Father, now we think of how it was that we sang a moment ago, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And we sang within that song Jesus was born to give us second birth. So God, right now, I pray that you will do a, a work amongst your people who are listening to me right now. Will you put your hand on your heart, everybody? The Bible says that out of the heart come the issues of life. God, as we rest our hand upon our heart, God, we want to pray a prayer of commitment to you. Now, I'm going to pray this prayer, and I ask you, if you mean it with all your heart, that you want Jesus to be your Savior. Perhaps you say, He is my Savior. I'm confident of that, Pastor. But I really want to rededicate my heart as I'm ending this year, about to launch the new year. I just want to be filled with the presence of God. I just want God to be as real to me as the breath that I breathe, as real as the heart that beats in my chest. If that's you... And pray this prayer out loud with me. I ask that we would all lift our voices now. Dear Jesus, I repent of my sin. You are holy. You died on the cross for me. You rose from the dead. I believe in my heart. I confess with my mouth that you are my Savior. You are my Lord. Now seal this by your spirit. I give you my life, my past, present, and future. And for some of us, we're going to pray this prayer as you have your hand over your heart. I rededicate my heart to you, God. 
Now, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it with all your heart, as every head is bowed and every eye closed, would you just put your hand right up in the air and then put it right back down? And God sees your hand. I've got bright lights in my eyes. I can't see a thing, but I can tell you God is watching. And it may be this is the most significant moment in all of your life that you're making a commitment here. So God, let everyone today leave here with absolute victory, absolute hope. God, we thank you that your healing just saturates every fiber of our being.